Good evening. For those of you who, uh, who I don't know, my name is Richard Summer. I'm the Dean of the Daniels Faculty of Architecture, Landscape, and Design. And it's my pleasure to welcome you here this evening for the last Bulltop lecture of the spring season. We're actually absolutely thrilled that all of you could join us tonight at Convocation Hall. That we had to move this lecture to a 900, uh, I'm sorry, 1500 seat theater is a testament not only to the enthusiasm for the exceptional architect we have with us here tonight, but also for, I think, the more broad enthusiasm that the design community in, in Toronto has for sophisticated architecture. And uh, for that, I'm very appreciative. This is the second time this year that the interest in a lecture has been so immense that we've had to move the location of the talk to U of T's largest lecture hall. Some of you may have been here to see Alvera Siza, which was our first lecture. This is the last lecture of the year, public lecture. Uh, and Alvera Siza was the first in September uh, when we presented him in collaboration with the CCA in Montreal. Tonight, I would like to take this opportunity to thank our sponsor for this lecture, uh, Bulltop, and its principal, Stefan Sibidlo. Bulltop, uh, for those of you who have been coming to our lectures uh, for the last, I think it's, this is our 10th year with Bulltop, uh, knows that they've made it possible for us to bring a wide array of exceptional speakers uh, from both here in Toronto and around the world. So, uh, and, and I think it's been a great service to, to our school and to Toronto. Past Bulltop Bull Top lectures just this year have included the architect Wolfgang Lorch from Lorch and Wandel Architects in Germany, Jack Diamond of Toronto-based Diamond Schmidt, and in recent years, Rudin Shizawa of the Tokyo-based firm Sana, Liz Diller of the New York-based firm Diller, Scafidio and Renfro, and last year our very own Mason White and Lola Shepard from the lateral office. Now, on to our featured speaker tonight, Su Fujimoto. Su studied architecture at Tokyo University and established his firm in Tokyo in the year 2000, an auspicious year for a modern practice. I think among the many reasons that tonight's lecture has attracted such a large audience is because Fujimoto's work challenges many of the notions we might hold about what architecture is, or maybe how it is manifest. For example, notions of what a house is or should be, or the expectations we have about what constitutes enclosure in architecture, or what the boundaries are between public and private space, or what the necessity is for traditional walls, ceilings, and floors. And perhaps most of all, I think he challenges expectations about architecture's relationship to nature. In short, the work brings up issues about the very atmosphere of where we live and work and uh, what it should be and what it should be like. You can see Fujimoto's probing mind and his architectural craft and work in such projects as uh, the House NA completed in 2011, as well as Final Wooden House and House N. Um, in 2013, Mr. Fujimoto became the youngest architect to receive the prestigious commission to design the Serpentine Gallery Pavilion in London, in London's Hyde Park. An unusual, an annual commission, which in previous years had only been awarded to major figures, such as Frank Gehry, Rem Koolhaas, and Zaha Hadid. Now, I'm gonna take a little bit of a, a digression here um, for a moment and speak to the loss of Zaha Hadid last week. Um, Hadid was a truly exceptional figure. I did not know her well, but I did meet her a few times over the years, and I actually spent a very memorable week as a young architect working with her at a workshop at MIT in the 1980s. She was not yet famous then, and I remember the old guard faculty at MIT being very patronizing and rather dismissive of her. And one particularly um, misogynist male member of the faculty referring to her as Maybelline because he saw her drawings and paintings as too decorative. But even then, my friends and I knew that she was a force of nature and a unique talent, and she had a reputation, although she had a reputation in a way even then as a prima donna, uh, we found up close that she was very warm generous, and actually, most importantly, very, very funny. So whether one liked her buildings or not, there is no denying her contribution. 
And I'm, I'm bringing this up not only because I think it's important in this context to acknowledge the passing of a, of a great figure, but I think there's been uh, sometimes an unfair backlash against so-called star architects in recent years, as if practicing on a global scale and having the will to bring buildings of great artistry into being is only, is only an ostentatious, ostentatious expression of cultural arrogance. But what Zaha Hadid accomplished in her lifetime would be, incredible, would be an incredible feat for anyone or any architect, let alone for a woman from Iran operating for many years as a sole practitioner. Which brings me to tonight's speaker. When people from outside the field ask me, and in my position as the dean of the faculty, I get asked this a lot, what is happening in architecture? How is it changing? And how has it changed, in, uh, especially in recent times, I most often dodge this question. I mean, it's a big world, and we get to see more things, at least in pictures, more quickly than ever before, so I always hesitate to generalize. I dodge the question usually by saying that one can't always see what is new or the progress uh, we are making in architecture by the way things look. It might just be as much today about the way things act or how they perform. So, um, for example, issues of temperature, energy, sound, and light come into play, and they're very complex in relation with a lot of issues. Um, and there's another, so, so there's this question about the aesthetics in architecture, and if we take a very common example, I have it in my pocket, and you say, well, okay, we have the iPhone, it's, a, it's an object of fascination and design, but as an aesthetic object, it doesn't actually move much far, too far beyond what uh, Dieter Rams was designing for Braun a half century ago. But what's inside of this, and the way the phone performs, well, that's a whole other uh, question and a whole other kind of revolution. So I would say that tonight's speaker both proves and defies this argument, this dodge argument that I've made about architecture, about it not being so much about the way it looks as much as it is about the way it performs. Fujimoto is part of a new generation in Japanese architecture. And by the way, uh, you can see uh, uh, this generation presented in a current exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art entitled A Japanese Constellation, which includes his work. Yet Fujimoto's work is part of this new constellation in Japan but different from it too. A colleague recently made the observation to me, or the generalization, if you will, that Japanese architecture today operates in two modes, white and clear. So Fujimoto partakes in this seemingly, seeming evacuation uh, of decorative effects, but he's not actually a minimalist. He's really more of a maximalist, proliferating the basic elements of architecture to an extent where they begin to approach what he calls nature, or at least inverts architecture's uh, expected relationship to nature. If you look at his design for the treatment center for mentally disturbed children, around this issue that I've raised of performance, or I da dare I say even sustainability, you may be puzzled. The initial plan is an almost Rorschach-like co composition of black squares. It looks like a Malevich painting. If one wanted to make a so-called efficient building, you would do the opposite of what you find with this project. You wouldn't break the building into a lot of different pieces. It would be one building. The project is broken, again, in, in a way into this series of discrete, seemingly identical rooms. The treatment center recalls, in a way, the counter-modernism of Louis Kahn and Charles Moore, who saw the power of breaking, the mo breaking down the monoliths of modernism into discrete parts in a sense, making classical buildings, but without the corridors or hallways. And it was just these corridors and hallways that made the early mental facilities oppressive and overly institutional. So in this case, one of making a safe space for children suffering from mental problems, Fujimoto's building does perform. It perhaps performs in the most important ways. And so I'm going to leave the rest for Mr. Fujimoto to say and to show. But now, bef before I bring him to the stage, I'd like to make two more notes about this evening's lecture. If time permits, we will be inviting questions from the audience and have set up two microphones. Where are they? 
back here. I can't see them because I made them turn down the lights too much. Um, but they're back there. There are two microphones and we'll have one up here. And then, okay, now I have to do the social media part. If you'd like to tweet or Instagram about tonight's event, I encourage you to do so using the hashtag, hashtag FujimoTO. I didn't come up with that. Was that you, Pam? Okay. Uh, <laughs> as printed on the handout and you received and entering the lecture hall. So would you please give a warm Toronto welcome on this unusually cold evening in, uh, for April to Mr. Suvu Fujimoto. And, uh, Thank you very much for inviting me to this beautiful space. It is, yeah, this is the first time for me to be here in Toronto. And uh, it's really pity I stay only today and the tomorrow morning I have to leave. But uh, yeah, I'm enjoying uh, this really coldness. <laughs> and, uh, but actually I was born and grown up in Hokkaido, the northern island of Japan. So yeah, I, it's like a, yeah, it reminds me of my hometown. But anyway, it's, 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 it's really nice to be here. And uh, yeah, today I will talk about this title, Between Nature and Architecture. It is like a yeah, big title. But uh, yeah, I like to start to think about architecture by questioning, questioning the really fundamental things. The, what is the relationship between nature and architecture? And then this question is leading us to think about, for example, what is the boundary or what is inside and outside? Or what is the relationship between human body and the space? Because the human body is rather a part of the nature and the architecture is more like a space. So the relationship be between human body and the space is also relating to such a very fundamental questions. So starting from this really basic big questioning, we can see the really deep fundamental question of architecture. And then going back to the beginning and finally could find, I think, something really fundamental, but something new, I think. But I'd like to talk about my uh, background a little bit. Yeah, as I said, I was born in Hokkaido. It's uh, cold and uh, full of nature. So in my childhood days, I was, I was playing around in the forest like this. And then when I get into the university, I moved to Tokyo. It's, it's this one. So you can see it's almost opposite. The nature is beautiful and the Tokyo, as you can see, it's quite ugly. But <laughs> after studying architecture and spending time in Tokyo, I felt some kind of a comfortable feelings also in Tokyo and felt interesting similarity between the nature, forest field, and the Tokyo, these kind of chaotic uh, situations. Because maybe, of course, it looks quite opposite. But uh, for example, in forest, you feel small tree leaves or tree branches, such a tiny scales, things are surrounding you to create a comfortable territory for you. It's like a cozy feelings, but still it's open. So protected, but still open for you to, to walk around. And in Tokyo, it's also created by such a small things, ugly, but the small things are surrounding you to create your territory. It's kind of a tiny, cozy uh, feelings. And as you can see, it's still open, so you can choose your own way to, to walk around. So it looks quite different, but how they are created is similar, I think. And it's a surprising moment that when I found out such a similarity between these opposite things, architecture and the nature and the chaos and the beautiful order had some similarities and sharing some essences. And then after that, I thought about the architecture relating to nature or nature relating to architecture and try to combine them to, together or try to 
see both of them as equal things to find out something new. And as I said, thinking about nature and architecture is leading us to think about various different types of the architecture questions, outside, inside, the straightness and the softness and simplicity and complexities, or is such a fundamental questions. So it is, uh, I think, the nice starting point. And especially this uh, Serpentine Pavilion project is like a questioning the project, questioning everything. What is architecture and what is the boundaries? What is inside and outside? What is the scales of architecture? Starting from a tiny scales to the furniture scales to the architecture scales and more like a landscaping scales. So this project is still quite important for me because it is re-questioning everything for me. And this, this was done in 2013, so it's already uh, three years ago. And yeah, it's like this. It's in the middle of the park, the Hyde Park. It's a beautiful green park. And we designed these kind of cloud-like structures, but all made by the steel pipes, two centimeter steel pipes. So it's quite thin and straight and artificial materials. But finally, it's, it's like, a, like a cloud. It's like a really soft impressions. And you can see the straightness of the steel pipes and the 90 degree grids is creating these, uh, how to say, the, the structures. This unit is the 40 centimeters and the, sometimes the double size, the bigger size, uh, 80 centimeters, the grids is there. So the combination of such a units are creating the whole things. But the thousands of the junctions and connections is creating such a nice complexities created by the, by the simplicities. And then we put the glass on it. So you can step on it or you can sit on it. So it is like a part of the furnitures and part of the architectures and it has a space inside. Yeah, you couldn't see where uh, is inside and where is outside. They are inside and uh, yeah, it's in between, between inside and outside. And we have a cafe counters here. So the basic program is a cafe. But the, it's in the park and it's open cafe. So the program is cafe, but the, the intention of the client is more like a, to provide the field for people to stay there, to spend their time as they like. So our starting point was what is not what is a cafe, not what is a pavilion, but what is the place where people can behave as they like in a different way every day, every time they come, and they could find new meaning of this place and a new way to use these places, so such like uh, the field of the diversities for people. And the starting point was, yeah, we proposed, we created this kind of a small paper models that, Maybe something looked like a Frank Gehry ones. It's like a, something like this. But uh, our intention was to create the landscape, architectural landscaping, by this continuous surfaces where people can, how to say, people can just sit on or walk around to use various in various different way as they like to to make an open field. But uh, we thought. Yeah, we are thinking to make these by, for example, concrete or steel plates or something like that. But uh, if we make it by concrete, it's really heavy and block the view or block the relationship to these beautiful surroundings. So I thought it's, it's too pity. Then after the discussion with my staffs, we found out to make this landscape transparent, but not by the glass, but more like such a, the grids made by the thin, uh, thin frames. So for make, transform these surfaces of the landscaping into the grids and to make it transparent. And finally, it is not the continuous landscape, it's more like a stepped landscape, but still it is providing the many, many triggers for people to interact with the spaces. and then it keeps the transparency and translucencies to make uh, interactions between the surroundings. So that was the, the whole process. And finally, it's like this. 
But actually, the interaction between the, the client was very, very exciting because the design period was very short. And uh, it started from the, the beginning of December 2012. And they says you have to fix the basic ideas by the end of the year, so only one month. It means every week or every uh, three, four days, we have to make the proposals and then make a communications and then get a feedback and then update. So it's, it's it was quite quick, uh, the whole process. And uh, yeah, it's the first sketch I sent, it was the, just one week after the commission, after just after the sending the sketches, I made a phone call because we have to talk directly with the director. The director is uh, Julia Payton Jones. She's really tough woman. Now, <laughs> now we have a good relationships after the whole fight for this project. And uh, but at that time, it was just, just we just we met, and then we we talk with a telephones and I send the sketches how is that I asked and she said no this is not the serpentine pavilion why this is too much Fujimoto like she said okay I think I am Fujimoto and uh, you appointed to Fujimoto but uh, you don't like Fujimoto like things <laughs> no she said <laughs> okay so yeah, I will make a new sketches in a week. And, uh, and then one week later, I send another sketches. How is that? I made another phone call. How is that? She said, no. No again. <laughs> Why? This is too much not Fujimoto-like. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you don't like Fujimoto and you don't like not Fujimoto and uh, how to do with that? <laughs> And then we did a huge discussion. And of course, I understand what she meant. It not, should not be like a obvious Fujimoto-like things, but should not be completely out of the Fujimoto things. It should be the continuity, should have a continuity from my previous small history of my career. And at the same time, it should be something new. So it was quite, how to say, great requirement a great honor, I think, to get such a tough requirements. And then we tried a lot to think about what we have been doing in past 20 years and what we are now thinking and what we will think in the future. So such kind of a deep, deep questioning of ourselves and of, of the architectures finally reached us to, to these proposals. And as I, can, as I said, it's like a, like a landscape. So it's from outside, it's more like a mountain. And you could sit on here, around here, like this. And you can step up until around here, not going up to the, to the roof. And then you can come in here to inside to find out another landscaping inside. So this is, of course, it has an inside, but the outside inside has also landscaping to, ma to make it like this topography of the frames. And you could choose where to sit on or where to locate yourself or where, how to behave on these stepping landscapings. Sometimes, of course, the furnitures, chairs and the tables are here on the floors. But the main part is more like these kind of a stepping, many, many, many stepping areas. And not only these kind of a landscaping furnitures, but the, all these landscaping are transforming into the ceilings and the roof structures, and then coming down onto the wall-like spaces. This is not the wall, but the, you're coming down to support the whole things. So in here, in a sense, there is no walls, no roofs, no ceilings, no windows, but it is all of them, such a fundamental aspect of the architecture is melting together to create one unity of, of, the, of the spaces. Just a moment. 
I like to see. Okay. And so this kind of a landscape inspire people to behave something some, sometimes it's quite strange, just walk up for nothing and just coming down. Or to have some isolations, even in, within such a open spaces. Or if you are together with a 10 friends, then it's more like a, how to say, the group areas could happen. Sometimes it's really crowded, and sometimes really, how to say, just a few people located on there. So depending on how or when you are there, or how many people with you, or depending on your feelings, or depending on the weather, the, your interaction is always changing. So we can say there is no functions in here, but if you are there, and if you start to interact with the space, then almost infinite functions are coming to you, depending on the situations. So it is kind of a super functional spaces, but at the same time, no function spaces. And the important, one of the exciting points of this is, as I said, there is no windows, there is no walls. It's more like a, the, just a mixture, so melting situations. As you can see, transparencies is coming out depending on the depths of the structures. Here, around here, it's, it's rather thin from your standing point, so it's getting really transparent. But around, this, around these areas over here, it has more depth of the structures. And then it's getting more translucent or almost opaque. So it means the relationship between outside and inside is, just depends on the depth of the structures. And it's always changing because if you walk around, then the apparent depth is always changing. And then, it was a very amazing moment to walk around to see how like uh, the transparency and translucency is always changing around you to according to you how to walk around. So it is completely different from the normal architecture which has the walls, solid walls and windows. It's more like a, I don't know, something beyond that to have more dynamic relationships between inside and outside. And this is a view of the opening lecture. So it's like a landscape of the people. The normally it's like a more transparent situations, but if people crowded within this landscape, then it's getting more opaque. So the whole space are created, looks like are created by the people, and uh, it's, it's really dynamic situations. And in the evening, it's, it's like that, it's light up. So, in a sense, it is like uh, the integrations of nature and architecture. I mean, for example, the materials is steel and straight and a 90 degree order, super artificial. But finally, the whole experiences or whole impression is more complex and soft and uh, un ex unexpected, un unexpected. And uh, yeah, the simple, but quite complex at the same time. And the furniture scales, or much more smaller scales, to the architecture scales and the landscape scales, the integration of the different scales are created. And of course, inside and outside relationships, sometimes the mix, the inside and outside, or clearly dividing such a things. So here in this project, we questioned almost all the architectural basic thinking. What is out, what is outside, what is inside, what is a wall, what is a window, what is the intimate spaces, what is open spaces, what is the definition of the furniture, so what is the architecture, and what is the difference between the landscape and architectures. Such a very, very basic things we questioned and then integrate them to create the one uh, spaces between the simplicity and the complexity. So, of course, this is just a pavilion. So, no strict boundaries of inside and outside. It's more like a loose spaces, but still it has 
it, it could be the starting point to rethink about the architectures yeah, for the futures. So I think it, it, this is quite important project for me. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's like uh, the basics of my thinking. And this house also relates, this is before Serpentine Pavilion, but relates to the Serpentine Pavilion too. It's a real house. It's not a pavilion, it's a real house. But it's quite small. It's a six meter by nine meter. So it's like a typical small Tokyo plot. So we discussed with the client and we agreed it's quite small. So if, even if we have the biggest living spaces, it's just a small living space. So we try to do the different strategies, not to have the size of the areas, but try to have the varieties or diversities of the experiences. So we divide the smaller plots in a smaller pieces to create these kind of a smaller platforms. The smallest one is a 1.4 meter by 1.4. And even the biggest one is about 2.5 meter by 2.5 meter. So it's like uh, the size of the bigger table. So it's almost all the floors, the platforms are almost the size of the furniture. And then stack them up to create the varieties, the differences of the spaces. So inside is like this. So you can see the furniture size platforms are stacked up to create the different uh, areas. Not only different areas, but the different relationships between each different platforms. Sometimes these two platforms create the tables like spaces or benches like spaces or this is the sleeping areas, but uh, if not sleeping, when not sleeping, it's like another platforms. And then furniture-like areas, libraries, but the reading space is there. And this space, the sitting height is almost like a one meter. So you couldn't stand inside. But you can sit in here, and once you were here, it's really tiny, protected, cozy spaces. Really intimate spaces. But at the same time, the whole height of the one space is sometimes more than five meters because of this kind of a, how to say, shifted, stacked, uh, systems, the experienced height is qu quite high. So between such a tiny intimate spaces to the five meter, six meter height, you can choose where to locate yourself or how to use these kind of platforms, benches or tables or one of the, if you have five, six friends, then it's more like a, the stadium, one guy there and another guy there. and it's the, to, to have a chat, three-dimensionally, in a sense. So, in this house, we, have, we don't have size of the spaces, but we could have the varieties of your choice to, to sit there or to read books over there or to have a chat face-to-face -face there or three-dimensionally there. And it's allow you to be innovative or to create to be creative to find out how to use these spaces it is something beyond your function function is not just a given but you could find it or you could create with the interaction with the spaces so that's the concept so as you can see not only because this is white or this is thin but uh, such kind of interaction between the spaces and your body and then you could find out the varieties of the usage. In that meaning, the Serpentine Pavilion in this house is, is sharing the concept. And then suddenly the size is quite expanding, but still keeping some kind of a, the concept. This is the project, the competition project in Middle East. And the site is almost one kilometer from the end of there and here. So it's quite huge. And the program is a huge shopping space, shopping center. So it's something so different from the previous two projects. And the first time, that was the first time for me to do some project in the Middle East. So I was so excited. The huge site and probably a lot of money and <laughs> crowd of potentials. 
but uh, of course, the first time, so I didn't know the climate conditions, cultural background. So I did, we did the researches, and finally found out these kind of uh, the proposals, something quite different from our previous works. We designed seven, eight towers. It's almost 100 meter high. It's not just towers, but it has a huge void inside like this, one of the tower like this, void, to make a natural ventilations because of the weather conditions, to bring the rather cooler air from the bottom and then the hot air is going up, going out. But at the same time, this huge void is like this. It's a part of the huge void of the shopping areas. It's like a making a, the rhythm of the shopping. Shopping, concentration of the shopping, and then have a break on this huge void. And again, the concentration of the shopping, and then another void. So it's like a, to making the, the rhythm of the experiences. But the most important point is these structures. As you can see, it has many circles and arch shapes. It is, of course, coming from their traditional uh, the motif of the arch, but we stuck them so much, too much, a lot of the, the layering of the structures to create the sunshade by the structures. The glass surface is set back from the surface of the structures. And then by this kind of a, a lot of the layers of the structures, it is making the filter for the sunlight. So as you can see, it's bright enough, but almost like uh, the many, many hundreds of the particles of the light is just coming in. And really well controlled the situations. But uh, at the same time, of course, it's not just a filter, it's a structure itself. And it is making the huge lands landmark, and it's making a huge void for the natural ventilations. So the integration of the cultural background art shape, and then the block the sunlight climate conditions to make a huge void to react to the program and to react to the another climate conditions and the bigness of the sites. So we reacted by the shape of the towers. So several different requirements, conditions, and the backgrounds are integrated in these uh, structural forms. So that is our, our proposals, to create the one structural proposals solve everything. But the interesting point for me was, of course, it seems like arch shape, but if you take out all the arch, then it's just a stacked grid. And it's almost the same as a serpentine pavilion, just a small grid, stack them up to create the, any kind of the shape. In a serpentine case, it's like a more, more like a cloud-like shapes. In this case, it's more like a, how to say, these kind of a tower shapes. But the way to create the structures or the way to create the, the space is almost the same. The only difference is the scales. The serpentine pavilion starts from these scales, the really human scales, and this one is starting from the three meter high. So it's getting more like a normal situations. So the serpentine case, we reinvent the, how to say, the floor height, the concept of the floor height. And after that, we're going back to the normal floor height. But the repetition of the units, it's so much inspired by the serpentine. And then finally, it is something different from the normal buildings. It's more like a, how to say, I don't know, the structures created by, by the light itself, like that. Sometimes, yeah, we put the waters, and then, I don't know, <laughs> the boats <laughs> moving around. <laughs> Must be fantastic, because we thought, yeah, this is the Middle East, so everything is possible as, as we wish. <laughs> so we are so excited, almost lost ourselves. <laughs> and create these kind of images for the, for the presentations. Yeah, it's, it's quite beautiful. It's almost like a translucent towers, and uh, yeah, created by the stacking the light itself.
But finally, after sending the 280 panels to Middle East, and then talk about when will be the, how to say, the visual presentation date, suddenly they send an email that the, the whole competition canceled. So you don't have anything, you, you don't have to do anything, and that's it. <laughs> Of course, sometimes or many times that's happened in architecture, in a real architecture world, that's happened. Especially this is the Middle East, so everything else has happened. So I realized <laughs> this, this didn't happen, but the, the competition stopping is happened. But still, I'm really, I like this project because, because of these unexpected situations. And the situations beyond my previous imaginations, huge size and different climate and the different cultural con conditions, our basic concept or our previous thinkings was expanded by such a precondition. And then we found out the different potentials of the thinkings. The serpentine is, of course, quite nice, really delicate, small project but ambitious, but in this one, suddenly the 100 times or 1,000 times bigger and so different directions, but still it is opening the doors for, of the future architectures. So I love such kind of an unexpected situation. I will be involved in such an unexpected situations and find out new potentials of the architecture thinking. It, it is quite, quite uh, exciting things. But more important things, why I show this project in this today's lecture is to look for the clients within this audience. <laughs> <laughs> this is nice project. <laughs> And you have money. <laughs> so if some of you are really seriously interested in, please just let me know. <laughs> we can collaborate. <laughs> okay, so going back to the quite small project again, quite Japanese small project. This is a public toilet in the nature. This is toilet, the glass box, and we designed this black wall too. Yeah, this is kind of a funny project, but uh, seriously, I love this project because the public toilet is, especially in these kind of smallest scales, it is revealing the really important essence of architectures or important question of architecture because it's public, but once you are inside, it's quite private areas. So what is public and what is private? We have to think about such a basic questions. And of course, it's like, a, yeah, the site is really countryside, nice surroundings. So it's nice to enjoy the view. But of course, at the same time, you have to protect yourself. So block the view or open the view, how to do with that? It's also quite fundamental question of architecture to make a wall or to make a windows, how to do with that? It's quite ancient questions. And of course, we have nature, architectures, such a, how to say, basic questions. So even in such a small, tiny and funny project of the public toilet, it has, it could have the basic, fundamental, important questions. And you could reinvent something new from, from that. And in this case, yeah, this is the, the situations, the glass box and toilet, and the, this wall is like this, surrounding. And we have a door here, and once you come in, you can lock the door from inside. So once you lock the door, this whole open garden is your private gardens. And then it's possible to do the toilet in this kind of a glass box toilet because the height of the wall is nicely designed to block the view even from this train. So it's, it's, it's possible. From inside, you can enjoy such a nice 
view around it, open feelings, but you are still protected. Because in here, we are just re-question what is the wall. Wall is normally blocking every different kinds of things, block the air, block the view, and it, it's, re it's really, really like that. But if we divide the function of the walls between just blocking the view and block the, the air, then this happens. This black wall is just blocking the view, but not blocking the air. So block the view from outside, but still the continuity of the air and the continuity of the landscape is happening. And this glass wall is not blocking the view, it's transparent, but blocking the air. So it is protecting you from the rain and wind and something. So it is just a simple strategy to divide the meaning of the walls in two parts and then to make a distances between one walls and another walls. And then it happens, it's possible to enjoy such an openness and enjoy the view, but at the same time well protected. So this is just a simple strategy, but to create some new values on it. I don't know if you like it or don't like it, but it's something different and something new. This is the plan. The wall, the glass box, and the door, and that's it. And it works. But of course, yeah, if you are kind of a emergency situations, it's a bit the tough things, yeah. Finally, you reach the doors and then you open the door and then you will find another 15 meter to, to run. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope, yeah, you, you could manage it. <laughs> but, and the wall is quite simple because the budget is not so, how to say, not so much. So we made these walls in a very simple way and the glass box in a simple way and keep these landscapes almost as it is not to make a too much fancy landscaping but just to keep the existing trees and just to make these kind of a green flower, green, green grass. But this is, I think, funny project but questioning what is the boundaries, what is the walls and what is the public and what is the private. So we always questioning about such a definition of architectural basic thinkings. And sometimes the definitions could be redefined and reinvented to be something better, for, suitable for the situations. If this toilet is located in the middle of the city, I didn't do this but the location was like that, the countryside, then it's possible, and the site was big. Of course, the clients didn't uh, think about, ah, we used such a whole site of this uh, part for the toilet, but uh, it's, it's possible, it was possible. And depending on the situations, every time we can question about such a basic things and then reinvent. This house is also dealing with uh, the boundaries, and it's almost the same strategy with the toilet previously. To question what is the wall and what is the boundary. The boundary is not only one, but could be like a layers between inside and outside. Oh, sorry. This is the bo three boxes, big box and middle box and small box. So box and box and box, and with many, many openings. But the big box has no glass on the openings. So inside of this big box is outside. So it has a trees. And then this box has a glass, skylights and windows. So inside of this middle box is inside, but still outside of this small box. So if you have three boxes, box in box in box, then the definition of inside and outside is blurring always depends on where you are or how you define your, how to say, activity spaces. If you think this is the main space, then this is inside of your house. But actually it is outside, but as a territory, it is inside. And then here, in between spaces, it's 
inside, but not deeply inside. So it's more gets closer to the outside. So you can choose. Yeah, this is the garden spaces. This is outside, but you are surrounded, protected by this concrete shell with many, many openings. So it's like a room, but it's outside. So this is the diagrams to show that kind of a concept. Normally the wall is dividing inside and outside. But if you think about such a gradations as a boundaries, not just inside and outside, deep inside, rather more inside, in the middle, rather getting outside, almost outside, but slightly still inside of your territories, then you could have more choice, like a serpentine pavilion or like a house NA, NA with a many, many steps. You could have more choice, depending on your feelings or depending on the weather, depending on who you are with or something like that. You could choose where you locate yourself. Then it makes, I think, your life more rich, I think. If you have more choice, then you could have, you could enjoy such a diversities and varieties, and you could be creative how you locate yourself or how to define uh, these areas in, in your daily life. And the definition of the plan is quite simple, simplify the concept. We have only three boxes, box, in box, in box, more inside. And then as a sections, box in box in box. But it's quite simple, but it has really, really many different areas in these places. So the simplicity and the complexity and the diversities are integrated together in here. And finally, it's done. You can see it's completely different from uh, surrounding buildings because normally this is uh, one of the typical house. Your garden is outside and your house here but we cover everything by one more box. So even your gardens is part of your, part of your house as a one extra rooms to create the layers. And once you are inside of this, uh, how to say, big box, you are covered by this big box with the skylights and with trees. So it's half outside, half inside feelings. And if you are deep inside, a small box, middle box, and a big box, and this cloud. So this layer, layering of the spaces is making you, you are really well protected, but at the same time, you are really open to the sky. You can see the skies are fragmented and surrounding you. 10, 20 skies are surrounding you. And sometimes the clouds is like another layers of the house, so the nature is part of your house. An amazing point of this house, I found out after the completion is, this big box is almost fragmentedly, you can see fragmentedly. And then you couldn't see sometimes how far, how high is this surface, because it's just framed and it's white, so no feelings of the distances. And then you could feel like uh, your house is expanding. It is actually the 7.5 meter high, the actual number. But in your impressions, it's more like a 20 meter high or almost gets closer to the cloud, the almost the same level. So the impression is your house is getting expanding or sometimes it's getting really shrinking to make really intimate scales. So house, or architecture is not moving. The site, the size of the site is fixed. But when you design a house like this, the, your experiences is beyond your site and beyond the size of the architectures. It is always expanding and shrinking according to your perceptions. And that is, I think, the richness of the architecture, I believe. And depends on your uh, lifestyles, you can choose the really protected corners or really open areas or really deep inside. So you can choose such a gradations from deep inside private areas to the, the more open public areas. So in that sense, it, is, it has more uh, variations than the toilet. It's more like uh, the house NA because it's a house, it's not a toilet. It's more complex. 
again, this is the garden. It's a, yeah, this garden area is more like a, the similar to the toilet project. So this one is not in Paris, but in France, in the city of Montpellier. It's the south of France. No, not that big city, but the, they are so energetic to bring architectures in, in the cities. And this is a housing in that city. Yeah, the south of France, you can imagine the weather is quite nice. And even the, for example, February, they can have a lunch on outside, on the outside terraces. And then, so because of that kind of a weather, their traditional lifestyle is, anyway, just go out to the terraces, not coming inside. Interior spaces is not so important. Of course important, but more exterior terrace space is important. But this is 50 meter high, high rise buildings and uh, 17, 17 story high. So how we can bring or relocate such a traditional their lifestyle into the contemporary architectures. And finally, our solutions was quite simple, just to put the huge balconies on the, on the uh, housing towers like this. It's, it's quite simple, but it's quite crazy. And, uh, but it makes sense. Biggest one is eight meter by five meter. So it's, the depth is eight meters. So it's, it's quite huge. It's like a, almost like a, the, another living space on outside. And uh, not only one balcony is for one house, but the two, three balconies for one houses. So you can choose which balconies or the meaning of the balconies is different. It's alongside the river, and the shape is a little bit softened like this because of the site conditions. We like to keep the green belt of the existing one to continue to the city context. So we push the volumes more close to this roundabout, and then we try to keep the view from these existing buildings as much as possible. So finally, we have this kind of a rather how to say, I don't know how to say, strange shapes. But because of these shapes, these balconies is getting more like a really organic, like a pine cone or pineapple or something like that. But it's not like an architecture in a, in a positive meaning. And as I said, yeah, many balconies, sometimes the duplex, the two levels houses has a two levels huge balconies connected by the staircases. So it's yeah, it's almost like the balconies is the main part of your life, and then the interior is just a supporting functions in it. A nice view to the Mediterranean Sea, and then nice view to the mountain also. And uh, yeah, this is now we start construction this this uh, May or June. Fortunately, we got a permission, <laughs> and. Uh, will be finished in two, three years because all the apartments are sold out quickly. Yeah, the developer was afraid. Anyway, it's, it, it is like, a, we thought it's good for the, how to say, the people who live there, but it's quite crazy shape. So everybody was afraid about the sales, but the, after starting the sales, it's, it's quickly sold out. Even. I myself couldn't, couldn't buy it. Not because of the, the prices, but the, of course, the price is not so affordable for me, but the, I thought, well, I get, get it and then sell it in a higher prices or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> but it was impossible <laughs> because it's quickly sold out. Anyway, yeah, you can see, yeah, the building itself, I, I can say it's, it's, it's beautiful. But uh, I think more exciting point for me is after, for example, five years after the completions, people start to bring their daily staffs, parcels, and uh, strange deck chairs and some things on these balconies. So from outside, there, are, there should be more and more like uh, the feelings of the life is coming out 
and almost cover all the architectures by such a daily staffs. That could be quite exciting moment where the huge contemporary architectures are covered by the traditional lifestyles and then creating the new landscape or new urbanscapes by this. I am really looking forward to see such a how does it, integration of their life and our buildings. We are just providing the platforms for their life and then three-dimensional life is creating the really real landmark of this city and this, of this climate uh, lifestyle, I think. So this is the project in Budapest. It is a, like a museum for the music and the music hall together because the Budapest and the Hungary is, is really famous in, in the music. And the site is in the middle of the park. This is a huge park, like a central park in, uh, in Budapest. And then they have a plan to make this whole park as a culture park. They are doing many competitions to make the cultural facilities in this park. And after our project, the SANA won the huge museum. And now another one competition is ongoing. And I'm one of the jury members and the, the famous architects are invited. So this is like a cultural district. And our site is in the middle of the park. So surrounded by the, such a huge trees. This is an artificial park, but the trees is already huge and gigantic. So what we can propose as a music hall in the forest, that was the first question. And our first answer, first inspiration was like this. No architectures, the forest itself could be like a beautiful music hall with the sunlight is coming through it and then nice scales created, protected by the canopy of the trees. And then, this is the natural, beautiful, perfect music halls, I thought. But of course, this is an architectural competition, so we try to transform these kind of basic ideas into architectural things. It was rather too much straightforward translations, but trans transform the forest into the architectures, this is a huge roof with uh, many perforated openings so that the sunlight is coming through it. And then under the roof is well protected and we put the music hall here, covered by the glass, and so really open to the forest. So the music hall, glass music hall in the middle of the forest with uh, several different skylights is coming in. So this is a section, huge expansion spaces we put it underground. Anyway, it's too huge. So we didn't know how to, how to deal with it. So we pushed it into the underground. And then on the ground level, entrance spaces and the music space and the event hall. So two uh, different types of the performing spaces and huge entrance spaces. All of them are open to the, to the forest. And uh, even within the roof, we put uh, educations and administration programs on it. So the sunlight is coming through these volumes sometimes. And this is uh, the roof plan. The shape of the roof is the circle, but it's it's wavy circle to fit more to the natural forest. It's not like a strong artificial shape of the, the circle. It's more like a softened. And these openings, uh, many of them are on the, on the trees, on the existing trees, so that the trees is penetrating through, through the roof. So it's more like an overwrapping between the trees and the, and the roofs. It's like this. But actually this perspective image is not true because we have a lot of trees here. So you don't see actually exteriors in this project. You only see, how to say, the ceilings. So when you walk around the forest, you gradually coming in under the canopy. This is a huge canopy area. So this is another, how to say, outdoor music performing spaces. You get into the canopies, but still canopy has many openings and the trees is going through the roofs. So it's between the canopies and the forest. And then gradually getting to the, to the interior spaces. But still it's glass and it's open 
view to, to the forest. So such a transition from the real forest to the half forest and the half canopies to the artificial forest is uh, the main part of this, this project. So this is a, the entrance spaces. The ceilings is kind of a reflective material so that the, the greens are reflecting to, to the ceilings. And then the glass, this is like a bending glass for the acoustic reasons to make more, how to say, random reflection of the sound. This is one of the small uh, performing spaces completely open to, to the surroundings. And some of the, them openings and some of them more acoustic equipments uh, are installed in that. And in the winter time, yeah, sometimes it gets snows and the slightly showing the, the exterior, exterior shapes. So here, we, 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 we can say this building is, has no exterior, has no, how to say, existence. It is just an experience for people. And then the forest, the real forest, half architectural forest and half real forest, and then more architectural forest is like a, a mixing together to create the varieties of the different areas of the performance or the areas of the, how to say, just to staying there, to spend their, their daily life, because this is in the park. This is also, we just submit the permission documents and uh, we start the, the detailed design phase. And we'll be finished almost the same as the, the Montpellier project. Okay, and this is the last one. We just won the gigantic development project in Paris. It is, the title is Milabre. It's a 1,000 trees because it has a lot of trees on it. <laughs> this is the whole, yeah, Paris did kind of a ambitious, huge uh, scales of the competitions because they chose 23 different sites and did 23 different competitions at one time to reinvent re Paris. Most of the site is, our site is on the highway, the ring highway, it's a peripheric. So most of the site is like a more like an empty plot or like a, to, to make the site better. It's, it's the, the basic situations because the Paris has all, all, already like a historical areas. So they don't touch such a historical areas. They just improve rather abandoned areas or empty areas to make the new uh, quality of the Paris. And our proposal is like this. It's a kind of a, <laughs> it's a bit, uh, the program is mixtures of the commercial, kindergartens and offices, housing and hotels. So such a mixed use, the huge, huge, uh, how many square meters? 67,000 square meters. And it is, this is a La Défense, the, the Grand Arche. So this is the axis, one of the famous axes from the La Défense to the, the Arch of Triumph, Concord, and the Louvre. So it's the main axis of Paris, and then we are here. This is, this is the, the line of the highway, the ring highway. And this is the model. A lot of greens. The developer says 1,000 trees, but nobody counted, so I don't know. <laughs> we have to make it 1,000 trees. Uh, yeah, this is the highway. So part of around here, it's on the highway. And uh, historically, the of course, the most of the European city has the, such a boundaries, like walls. And then in the 60s or 50s or 60s, they had a plan to make the walls areas as a green belt. But after that, they made just a highway for the functional reasons. So we try to rebring the greens on this periphery to make, to reborn, rebirth the, the previous plan to make a green uh, rings for the Paris. And this is a view 
from the rooftop to the Eiffel Tower, because as you know, the city of Paris has the height limitations. It's like a, from 30 meter to 35 meter or something. So this is also defined by the height limitations. We thought it's nice to follow to such kind of a traditional Paris structures, but bringing something new to that. So this was the basic diagrams. This is the Osmanian uh, Paris apartment. And then we bring, we open the lower level to the public park. It's like a forest. Of course, we have an office and we have a kindergartens, but the basic concept is open the lower part as a public forest. And then the Paris rooftop is quite nice, I think. I love such a, how to say, nice diversities of the different shapes of the Paris rooftops. It's ongoing, almost the same levels, almost infinitely. So we transform these Paris rooftops in a, like a small villages, floating villages with many, many trees, floating forests and floating villages just above the city of Paris. City of Paris is almost the same height, so the village is just floating above the Paris, so that you could see, you could enjoy such a panoramic view of the Paris, but still it is, how to say, harmonized with the height limitations and the structures of the Paris. So respecting the Paris, but at the same time to reinvent the Paris. So this is the main concept. And the lower part, yeah, this is like that. We have a program that we can make the hilly landscape to, to walk up. And then you could see the floating villages above with the, with the many, many trees. And this is, this project is rather, I could say this is rather too much straightforward to bring the many trees into the cities. But as a huge urban scales, sometimes such kind of a big gestures is also quite exciting. To bring 1,000 trees in the buildings to make the gigantic floating uh, forests and villages in, in the city of Paris. It is a urban strategies. As a urban strategies, it's straightforward, but at the same time it's quite how does a big impact on it. Compared to the serpentine pavilions, this facade is beautiful, oh sorry, it's beautiful, but it's a normal facade. No, how to say, questioning about inside and outside this, at this point. But uh, scales is also quite important. Sometimes if we focus on the urban scales, then for now we don't care so much about the each different things. But uh, of course, after developing the designs, we rethink about the more and more smaller things, detailed things, and definition of the villages, and definition of offices, and something like that. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's it. That's it. Thank you. It's late, but we're going to take a few questions. Um, if anyone has a, any any burning questions, you would come to the mic here and here, or maybe uh, people in the front here, I could walk to you. Hi, my name is Jasmine, and I had a question about how some of the spaces are heated in the winter, like for example, the Budapest House of music, Hungarian Music. Um, it's a lot of glass, but there was a winter render, and I was wondering like, how the spaces are heated in the winter time. Well, yeah, Budapest is getting really cold, so, but the glass is double glass, of course, and the uh, seating is very, so actually it's like a normal. <laughs> <laughs> Heating's on the floors, and the uh, glass is double glass, and the seating is, uh, it has a room, so it, it's very thick, and so it's, Wow, how, how, how to say? It's, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> of course, we are collaborating with uh, the consultant of the MEP and sustainability and uh, discussing about the, the quality of the sustainable things. And the clients like to have such a high level of the, uh, what, what they call, yeah, in the US, a lead or something. It's like a gold level of that, that kind of things. So we are trying to achieve that. Thank you. Hey, thank you for the presentation. Um, 
really enlightening. Uh, question in regards to uh, context, I guess. In terms of um, how Sen, you said uh, it's, it seemed quite different from the surrounding areas and the relationship with the different other, other houses versus um, like the, the Paris project, you kind of try and integrate elements of the surrounding. Um, I was wondering, like, how, what, what is the relationship like usually with the, I guess, the city and the community when it comes to, like, how do we um, work out the heritage or the context? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in case of the Japanese a city, as you know, the house, private house is always changing every, for example, 20 years or more shorter because they like to rebuild it, just demolish and rebuild it. So you can see, it's not like a traditional, beautiful Japanese uh, community. It's just uh, the rebuilding of the cheaper, cheaper buildings. So in that case, I was wondering, we have to follow to the existing situation or we propose something, what we think ideal to that kind of a community because the existing situation is just a temporary. And then every time it's changing and more and more mass production of housing makers, housing companies, houses is, is increasing. It's, for me, it's not so good things. It's cheaper and destroying the, the feelings of the, how to say, the value of the life and something like that. So we decided to make something, even something different, but could propose some alternative for the neighbors to rethink about the new value of lifestyle or something like that. So house NA and house N, quite different from surroundings, but uh, our intention is to more to propose something for, for, for people. Thank you. Time for one more here, maybe. You guys have to choose. Yes, I have a Yes, I have a question in regards to the uh, Serpentine Pavilion mm -hmm. and uh, the layering of the complexity of the simple forms and how did you know when to stop of like putting the cubes together as that form starts to build up? How did you know when to stop as it's uh, compared to a, sort of like an abstract painting of a, the mm -hmm. simple forms? Yeah, actually we finally relieved from the deadline. I mean, <laughs> deadline save us to stop. Otherwise, we almost infinitely continue how to do with that. But actually, that, that is quite important question, I think, because in this kind of a complexity, if you handle this kind of a complexity, it's quite difficult to understand what you are doing and uh, to create the space unexpectedly imagining or unexpectedly uh, formed is finally should be designed intentionally by us. So it is quite strange balances of what we are doing now is with our intention but should be percepted as a, how to say, without the intentions or something like that. So it was kind of a, I, I don't have any answer because it is still quite important questions. But for us, I myself didn't do every location of the cubes, or every, uh, how to say, I didn't do everything, but uh, my staff make it, and I see it, and I make a comments and something. So if you do the design with a team, then Nice things is it's out of somehow out of your intention, and you could find something nice from what you what your staff, what your collaborator did, or sometimes I add or I take out something after making a huge model like this. I start to make it more how to say mysterious because. On the last phase of the design, we made this one to ten model, and then I found out. Before that, I just we just did uh, by the computers, and I found out it's too simple, too easy to understand. So I like to avoid such kind of a how to say understandable situations. So I started to make add something strange things or take out some of them to make it more mysterious, because if it is mysterious, 
people, it makes people to think how, 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 to, how to make a communication, I thought. So, but every time it's, 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 it's quite important questioning. And I'm not so sure we can make, for example, just a computer program run and make a, uh, the best or some final situation as a final answer or not. Because, wow, it, it, it's still quite, quite difficult to, to define it. So the same as the, same as the Middle East project, it's, it's almost like a, created by, by the accident in a sense. Okay, I think we're gonna wrap. I really wanna thank you for a um, fantastic lecture and for making the long trip here. <laughs> So, uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks.